Hi, I'm Elon Musk. Um, I'm the co-founder of uh, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, PayPal, and Zip2. Um, I currently run Tesla and SpaceX, and I'm chairman of uh, SolarCity, and I'm here to answer some reader questions. The first question is, uh, how did I break into the business world? Um, well, uh, I started Zip2 um, instead of going to graduate school at Stanford. So I originally came out to California to um, uh, do a PhD at Stanford in um, material science and, and applied physics and basically working on advanced uh, capacitors for use in electric vehicles. So I had a long-standing interest in um, sustainable transport uh, and sustainable energy in general. Um, and I, I came out in 95 and then um, started working on some internet software in the summer of 95 and um, uh, decided to defer uh, grad studies at, at, at Stanford um, and try starting an internet company. Um, and uh, uh, it, it wasn't from the standpoint of actually sort of wanting to be an entrepreneur necessarily, uh, but uh, I, I actually applied to Netscape at the time, but they didn't respond to me. So that was the only internet company that I was aware of. So lacking any other internet company, I had to make my own. Um, and that's what uh, resulted in, in uh, Zip2. Um, and Zip2 built uh, soft internet software for uh, newspapers and other media companies. Uh, so it had New York Times, Knight Ritter, Hearst, and a bunch of others as investors and customers. So essentially, Zip2 helped bring the, uh, the media companies online in the early days. Um, so that was, that was my start in, in business, I guess. Uh, but re really, I think myself as more kind of a, like an engineer who uh, but in order to do the invent the things that I that I want to invent and create them, that I I have to do do the company as well. So I'm somewhat uh, uh, reluctantly the the, the CEO. Um, not not my preference actually. How was I involved in co-founding PayPal? Uh, so the PayPal story is quite complicated, even though it took place over um, a relatively short period of time. Uh, it was about roughly three and a half years. Um, from the creation of the company to it being sold to, to eBay in mid-2002. Um, and PayPal was created uh, uh, from the merger of two companies, um, uh, X.com, which I founded, and um, Confinity, which was founded by um, Peter Thiel and Max Levchin. So we kind of combined our resources in uh, early 2000. And both companies were only about a year old uh, at the time. Um, and then. Uh, we uh, uh, were able to, by sort of pooling our resources, we were able to survive the dot-com implosion of uh, late 2000 um, and then ultimately go public in early 2002 and then have a successful sale to eBay later that year. Um, that's a summarizing a crazy amount of stuff that happened over that period of time. <laughs> what are your thoughts on PayPal being criticized for stealing account numbers, hidden fees, and not being a reliable money transfer system? <laughs> well, um, uh, there's definitely lots of things that should be fixed about PayPal. Um, but unfortunately, since I um, uh, am, you know, have not been part of the company since 2002, it's difficult for me to do do things about about PayPal. I, th I think there's like a lot of functionality that, that should be added and um, a lot of things corrected and there's still errors in the PayPal system like mis mistakes and structure that, that I put there and uh, you know I, I really you know there's no actual good reason for them being there. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would, we just didn't have enough time to kind of fix them um, and um, uh, I certainly think the fees are too high and there should be much more functionality added to the system. Um, and, and overall, PayPal has the opportunity to become um, the financial, you know, the, the, the financial services company that, that addresses everything that a person needs. Um, and uh, it, PayPal could really quite quickly become the largest uh, consumer bank in the world, I think. Um, you just need to take away the reasons that people remove money from the PayPal account. And then it's like, well, why not just use it for everything? So, um, uh, and, and somewhat, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but I think if you reduce the fees in the PayPal system, then 
uh, the revenue will be greater because more people will use it. Question four is how did SpaceX come to be and what are the long-term goals? Um, well, the reason for SpaceX, uh, uh, which, and, and the, the full, form, full company name is SpaceX, Space Exploration Technologies, uh, the, the reason for SpaceX is to, or the goal of SpaceX is to develop the technologies necessary to make life multiplanetary. Um, or at least get us, you know, make progress in that direction. I'm not saying that, I'm not asserting that we, we will develop all those technologies, but we're going to try and, and, and at least advance the, the cause of space exploration as much as, as possible. Um, the, uh, the key invention that needs, that someone needs to come up with, whether it's SpaceX or, or another company, is a fully and rapidly reusable uh, orbit class rocket. Um, this is an extremely difficult thing to invent um, because Earth's gravity is quite strong. Um, even for an expendable rocket, if you uh, use the most advanced materials and advanced design techniques and um, get super efficient, you, you typically would get 2 to 3 percent of your liftoff weight to orbit. That's a pretty small number, and if you would just make a few mistakes in the design of the rocket, you will get nothing to orbit at all. Um, and that's why only a few countries have reached uh, orbit, just a handful. Um, and um, uh, so, so then if you say, well, now let's make it a fully reusable system, um, then you have to take into account all of the um, increased weight of the, to make the system more robust, to withstand the rigors of reentry. You have to have uh, heat shields. Uh, you have to have something that's going to bring the rocket back to the launch pad and then be able to land it, so whether it's parachutes or propulsive landing. Um, and uh, all, all these things add a lot of weight. And um, in the past, when people have tried to make a fully reusable system, they've gotten sort of part way and then, had, and then basically canceled the effort because they realized they would get a negative payload to orbit. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that, that's what SpaceX is really trying to achieve um, long term, and I, th I think I think we've got a good shot at achieving that. Um, and um, uh, some people say might say, well, why why care about reusability? Well, if you think of any mode of transport, um, consider whether it would get any use if it was not reusable. Whether it's a horse, a bicycle, plane, car. Um, you know, if you look at a, uh, at, the, at the cost of a of a Falcon 9 rocket, to build the rockets maybe about uh, 50 million dollars, but the cost of the propellant, of the, the, the fuel and oxygen and so forth, is only 200 thousand dollars per launch. So that's only about 0.3 percent of the cost of the um, of, the, of the vehicle. Uh, or the, so just like a plane, how much does the cost? How much does the plane cost, and how much does the fuel cost? Obviously, the fuel is quite small compared to the, the cost of the plane. It's the same with rockets. Um, so if uh, if, if someone can invent a fully reusable rocket, and to be precise, it needs to be fully and rapidly reusable, uh, like, like a plane, uh, then the cost of launch uh, would drop by about 100. Uh, that, that's pretty significant, um, maybe more than 100. So, um, and and that, that's a critical factor if life is ever to expand beyond Earth and become multiplanetary, because you figure there's got to be ultimately would have to transport um, millions of people and millions of tons of cargo. Um, and if, if rockets were not reusable, well, um, you, you just simply wouldn't be able to make, I don't think you'd even make enough rockets. Um, and where the discarded stages w were being dropped, I mean, you'd, there'd be a small island of, of discarded stages, <laughs> uh, just in terms of the sheer number of uh, expanded rocket stages. So um, I think it's pretty pretty intuitive uh, that, that this is what has to happen um, and, uh, and, and someone, SpaceX or, or some other company, has to make this, this pivotal invention. And it, it really is, it's something that will shift the entire future of life as we know it, if, if, if that's invented. Um, uh, because, you know, li life has been confined to Earth for four billion years, uh, that's a long time. and. Um, you know, if, um, if 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 there's no uh, if no one if if life does not become multiplanetary, it will eventually um, 
go, go extinct on Earth, um, if, if for nothing, if for no other reason than, than gradual expansion of the sun. Yeah, that's sort of a lengthy answer there. How did Tesla come to fruition? Um, now all, all of these stories are quite long stories, so I'm trying to uh, condense them to relatively short answers. Um, well, a, as I mentioned earlier, um, I've had a long-standing interest in um, electric cars because I think that's um, the, the way to achieve sustainable transport. Um, and um, you know, that's the original reason I came out to California was to study to try to develop uh, energy storage mechanisms for, for electric vehicles. Um, and uh, I guess it was in 2003, um, I got a call uh, from um, uh, J.B. Straubel and another guy uh, who wanted to meet and talk about space stuff. And then during that conversation, they also happened to mention electric cars because they were both, they, they were, they're pretty interested in electric vehicles. And they mentioned a company called AC Propulsion uh, in Southern California that had developed a, um, a kind of a prototype uh, electric sports car uh, with really good statistics, like zero to 60 in under four seconds, 250 mile range. Now, it was just a primitive kit car. So basically taking a kit gasoline sports car, added lithium ion batteries to it, and uh, achieved that performance. Um, so I got a demo in the car, and I was like, whoa, this is great. And so I tried to convince AC Propulsion to commercialize the, the, the sports car, but they were not interested in doing so. Um, and uh, eventually, after not being able to convince them for several months, I said, OK, look, if, if you guys don't do it, then, then I'm going to, you know, then I'd like to try to commercialize uh, electric sports cars, because I think that you know, we really need to show that you can make a compelling electric car. Um, and then they said, well, if, um, you know, if you're going to do that, then let's connect you up with a few other people. So uh, uh, I connected up with J.B. Straubel and then uh, a couple other guys, Martin Eberhard, Mark Toppening, and Ian Wright. Um, and we created uh, Tesla Motors um, to essentially commercialize the, T, the, the, the T0, which was the AC propulsion uh, car. And um, yeah, and obviously st started that company with a lot of naivete about uh, what it takes to create a car company. <laughs> um, and pretty much everything went wrong. Uh, so um, ultimately, I think it took um, five times the amount of capital that we thought it would to bring the Tesla Roadster to market and get it up to and, and iron out the issues. Um, it's a pretty capital intensive business and I mean that, that's why um, if you look at the car companies that exist in the country today, I mean, General Motors, Ford and Chrysler all, all got started a hundred years ago roughly. Um, so clearly uh, it is not an industry conducive to startups. Um, but uh, at this point Tesla is actually doing pretty well. Uh, we've delivered a, um, a couple thousand roadsters in over 30 countries. Um, customers seem pretty happy with that, and we're at a very advanced stage with the Model S sedan, um, which is due to come out around the middle of next year. So that's, uh, I feel really good about where things are with Tesla. Will Tesla cars ever become affordable uh, for, to the middle class? Um, well, with, with, the, with the Model S sedan, uh, we're aiming to um, significantly improve the affordability of the car, because we're going from the roadstead about $100,000 to the Model S, which is start, has a starting price of about $50,000. Um, so it's a big step, it's sort of, you know, it's, ha it's half the cost and uh, the functionality is um, much broader because it's, it's uh, uh, designed to carry a, up to seven people, a tremendous amount of cargo space, uh, a five star crash rating, um, great ride and handling. Um, it's really going to be a super great car. I mean, our goal with the Model S is, our aspiration with the Model S is to make the, the best car of any kind, and not just the best electric car. Um, then the third generation beyond the Model S, uh, um, that, that's where we're aiming to get to about a $30,000 car. Um, and uh, and that, that's you know, hopefully in about uh, four years or so, maybe five years. We'll, depends on how well uh, things go in the, over the next few years. But, but certainly, uh, 
the, the goal of Tesla from the beginning has been to make um, mass market cars. Uh, it's just that uh, we didn't really have a big enough factory or enough uh, money to, to do that. Um, so we're, we're kind of earning our way there um, in the shortest path possible, which is um, you know, first generation being expensive, low volume, second generation with the Model S being mid-price, mid-volume, and then the third generation being um, low price, high volume. Uh, what, what's your role at Solar City, and what are you working on there at present? Um, so at, at Solar City, um, I'm the chairman of the board and, and largest shareholder. Uh, yeah, but fortunately, um, I do not have to be there day to day. I, I just show up for the board meetings and hear the good news. That's that's basically what I do at Solar City. Um, the co-founders there, uh, Lyndon and Peter Rive, uh, really uh, deserve the credit for making Solar City what it is, um, and they've done uh, done an amazing job. Um, Solar City is, is now the, the largest provider of solar powered systems in the country. Um, and uh, yeah, it's awesome. They're, they're just growing like gangbusters. Um, and very, very simple goal, which is to um, make solar power as affordable and widespread as possible. Um, and they're growing the company about as fast as I think it's possible to grow a company. Um, so they're yeah, re going really, really well. If you could clone yourself and take on one or two more big issues aside from renewable energy, environmental cleanliness, and space exploration, what would they be? Um, well, there's there's a couple of things that, well, there's maybe three ideas that I have that I would I'd like to execute on at some point, um, you know, but without um, affecting what I do at Tesla and. SpaceX. Um, uh, I think I think uh, it's possible to create a much better airplane. Um, that uh, I have a design in mind for a, a vertical takeoff and landing supersonic uh, electric jet um, that kind of combines um, what I've learned at SpaceX and Tesla. Because sort of SpaceX has got the aerospace side of things, and Tesla's got the electric powertrain side. Um, and I think that would be a really cool um, vehicle to have in the world because uh, you wouldn't need big runways um, and you could get places fast um, and be relatively quiet um, and um, and of course it would be very low cost to operate and uh, um, and good for the environment and all that. Uh, so that's one idea. And uh, another is um, what. So it sounds kind of mundane, but um, prefabricated metal sections for creating a double-decker highway. Um, and uh, living in LA, this is something that uh, I've gotten, I've had a lot of opportunity to think about. Um, and uh, it's a bit tricky to, you know, if you, if you want to increase throughput on a highway, um, because you want to be able to do it ideally without affecting the existing traffic. Um, as the, the current construction on the 405 is is can be very uh, very annoying, um, uh, and um, and and then when they're, they're widening the 405 right now, and uh, it'll be nice to have that extra lane. But in the meantime, we often have like minus one lane. Um, so I think if you could have, if you if you could really think of double deckering a freeway, it's, double decker is the wrong word because I'm actually thinking of kind of like a a box section. Down the center divider, uh, with an, a lane on the bottom, a lane on the top, um, and uh, uh, but but then you know just created as prefabricated sections so you can could drop it in place like a Lego system. Um, I think that would be really cool. Um, somebody should do that. <laughs> um, and then uh, the third thing is um, I think uh, I think the, the the fusion problem is probably easier than. People think it is, um, and by this I'm talking about magnetically confined fusion. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a problem which gets easier as you um, as you scale it up, because um, you get like a surface to volume advantage. Um, so like, it seems like a pretty obvious thing that you could, if you made it big enough, you could have a really effective um, magnetically sort of 
magnetic, magnetically confined fusion uh, reactor. Uh, that's probably not the easiest problem to solve in relative, or, or there's, you could do like a thorium fission reactor or a better fission reactor. So it's, maybe it's not the, maybe it's better to do better fission reactors, but, but I think fission does have a bit of a marketing problem. So, uh, and fusion is the energy forever solution. So um, that's, uh, those are the interesting things that I can think of. To what do I attribute my drive to take on such large issues? I want to be in, in, involved in issues that will have a significant effect on the future. Um, and um, yeah, um, let's see. I guess I can probably trace that back to when I was uh, a teenager. And um, I was trying to figure out what's the meaning of life. Um, and there didn't seem to be any good answer. Um, so uh, it seemed like, well, then in the absence of having a good answer, then we should try to expand the scope and scale of human consciousness in order to better appreciate the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve and figure out what questions to ask. Uh, just like uh, Hit the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, with, with Douglas Adams, he, you know, he really hit the nail on the head that the really tough part is figuring out what questions to ask. Once you have a properly phrased question, the answer is comparatively easy. Um, so, uh, so if we're going to do that, then we, we, we obviously want to maximize the likely um, lifespan of humanity and expand beyond Earth and you know, just sort of get a better understanding of the universe. So that's, so I, just, I, I thought I'd get involved in things that would do that. What future propulsion techniques will drive space exploration in the future? Um, well, it, it, um, so he, here's sort of an ironic thing, which is I think, I think that essentially all modes of transport will go fully electric except for rockets. <laughs> um, and the, the problem with, with, uh, with uh, getting out of Earth's gravity well is that uh, it's very difficult to escape Newton's third law, um, which is that you, you kind of need to react against something. Um, or, or you, know, you, need to, you need to expel matter in order to have the opposite reaction um, and have that momentum transfer such that you can move. Um, I mean, there are sort of some ideas about having space elevators and that kind of thing, but I, I, don't, I don't think those are likely to be successful. Um, so you, you, you do need chemical propulsion, um, but I think that you, we can certainly improve on the chemical propulsion that's been done thus far. Um, and I think probably uh, a very high efficiency light hydrocarbon engine uh, that uses sort of predominantly methane is probably a good way to go. Um, and that's something SpaceX will, like, will end up working on. Um, once you get uh, into space, or into orbit, I should say, um, then there are in interesting potential. I mean, I, I think having. Um, High-powered ion drives are probably a good thing for interplanetary transport, um, and um, and then there's some, some interesting ideas about having um, solar sails or uh, sort of solar electromagnetic sails. Um, th those could be those could be interesting ways to go, um, but I think I think if if we can establish a base on Mars, um, and that and that, that will then create a forcing function to improve uh, space transportation technologies and all sorts of things that we don't really know about today will get invented in the future. But you, you kind of need that forcing function, just like um, before there was a need to cross the Atlantic, there wasn't really a forcing function to improve ships. Um, but once there was, you know, the United States was there, then um, there was a, a, you know, a, a big incentive to improve uh, shipping technology across the, the Atlantic, um, and um, actually, that that's that brings you back to the reusability thing. You know, if if ships had not been reusable uh, in the days of American colonization, then the United States would not exist. All right. So the next question is: Has your definition of a good idea for a startup or innovation changed in the past five to seven years? Uh, no, not really. I think it's pretty much the same same idea. Um, if you're going to create a company, you have to come up with 
uh, a product or service that would that you think would be compelling that would you know serve, serve some need, um, and then really a great company is just built around um, a, a great product or service. Um, that's the whole purpose of a company is to propagate that product or service and put it in the hands of people who would find it uh, useful. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's that's the main thing is try try to think of the most useful thing you could do for your fellow human beings, and uh, and then and then try and then a company is the process of scaling that up and in scope, you know, increasing that in scope and scale. With the downturn of the economy, RVC is less likely to invest in startups. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not sure what the how much venture capital is being invested right now. Um, I think it's it, it, not, actually I don't even know if, if it's a, a big change. Um, but but there is a lot of venture capital being invested. So. Um, I, I, th I think there's, there's, st there's still plenty of venture capital for good ideas. Um, and uh, I think the, the best way to attract venture capital is to try to c come up with a demonstration um, of, of whatever product or service it is. Um, and uh, ideally, take that as far as you can. Just you know, see if um, uh, you can actually sell that to real customers. Um, and. And, and start generating some momentum, and then uh, the, the further along you can get with that, then the more likely you are to get funding. What's the best advice you have for aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, well, I think uh, uh, starting a company is, is a very tough thing. Um, there's a friend of mine, Bo Lee, who's, whose phrase is, uh, you know, starting a company is like um, staring into the abyss and, and eating glass. Um, so uh, you should certainly expect that it is going to be very hard. Um, it's going to be harder than getting a job somewhere uh, by, by a pretty good margin. Um, and um, the, the odds of you losing the money that you've invested or your friends have invested is, is pretty high. I mean, that's just, those are just the basic facts. Um, so uh, if, if you don't mind things being really hard and, and, and high risk, then uh, Starting a company is, is a good idea. Otherwise, it's it's probably unwise, and uh, will certainly stress you out. <laughs> um, so I think you have to be pretty pretty driven to make it happen. Um, otherwise, you will just make yourself miserable. Um, and then and the, and then in, in creating a company, as I said a moment ago, it's just uh, you just want to really say how, how do you make the best product or service possible. Um, you know, companies that don't make good products or service, services just shouldn't exist. You know, that's, I think that's just pretty logical. How do you stay focused, motivated, and maintain enthusiasm when things don't go the way you had hoped? You know, I think my, my sort of drive to get it done is somewhat disconnected from hope, enthusiasm, or anything else. I just, I, I actually just don't care about hope or enthusiasm, motivation. I just. Give, every, give it everything I've got, irrespective of, of what the circumstances may be. You know, uh, yeah, you just, you just keep going and get it done. How do you find balance in your life being involved in so many companies? Uh, well, I think you know, balance, it depends on what somebody's definition of balance is. If, uh, I think my life would be very unbalanced by most people's definition. Uh, since I, I work quite a lot, um, and uh, you know, I probably uh, put in sort of somewhere between eighty and hundred hours a week of, of work, which is which is a lot. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, and then the, m most of my remaining waking hours are spent with my kids. Um, so that's uh, that, that's my life. I wouldn't. I would say it's relatively unbalanced. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the great thing about having something like an iPhone or Blackberry or whatever is uh, that you can um, kind of intermix uh, activities so um, I can kind of be with my kids and on email at the same time uh, since they, they don't require constant attention. Uh, what are a couple of inventions you expect to change the world in the coming years? Well, I, I, I think the, the the biggest problem, terrestrial problem that that 
Earth faces is the sustainable energy problem. Um, and um, so, so I think there's going to be a number of breakthroughs in that arena because, well, they kind of have to be, but I think, that, I think there will be, as, as I say, necessity is the mother invention. Um, so I'd, I would expect to see significant breakthroughs in uh, energy storage, uh, and um, that's probably maybe the biggest area. Uh, probably breakthroughs in energy generation as well. Um, Although I actually think that there have been some pretty big breakthroughs in solar power. In fact, a lot of people um, are unaware of the fact that the cost of solar panels has dropped by a factor of basically almost four. So it's certainly three, but almost four over the last five years. That's a massive, massive reduction. I classify that as a breakthrough. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, there's going to be huge breakthroughs in genetics. Um, in, in decoding uh, DNA and, um, and then also writing DNA. So once you've read DNA you, and you figure out where's the, the error, you want to you sort of write uh, the corrective code. I mean, DNA is basically firmware. Um, so, uh, you know, if, you, if, if there's a disease that somebody has and it's genetic and you could sort of fix that, and you, I think we, we may be able to fix uh, sort of Alzheimer's, and so I expect there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs in um, in, in the genetics area. Um, that that's that's that that's going to be really really huge. Of course, the, a lot of the, the biggest uh, breakthroughs are going to be difficult to anticipate in advance. Um, Yeah, but probably the whoppers are energy, you know, energy transport, um, and and genetics. Um, pro probably there'll, there'll probably be um, some some really big breakthroughs in understanding of the human mind and consciousness, as well. Uh, so, how did it feel to have Iron Man based on you? Uh, well, I should point out that uh, Iron Man was only partially based on me <laughs> because. You know, I've got five kids, and Iron Man, didn't, you know, sort of swinging bachelor. Um, so, uh, but I guess it's kind of cool. Um, and uh, we've got a an Iron Man statue that was donated by to SpaceX by John Favreau, signed by the whole cast, including Scarlett Johansson, and everything. It was kind of cool. That's so. It's, yeah, that's pretty cool, I guess. <laughs> uh, what happened to the top? Gear debacle over the Tesla Roadster, um, and this is basically where Top Gear uh, um, falsely implied that uh, the Tesla Roadster had run out of uh, energy w when they tested it, which which it didn't. Um, in fact, because w w the whole vehicle is a detailed computer lock, so we can see it, and um, and, and then also we um, when we dropped the car off. Uh, one of our guys happened to see a script sitting on the table. Um, he'd already dropped the car off, and so reading through the script, and in the script, the car breaks down. I'm like, wait a second, you wrote the script <laughs> before we even gave you the car. <laughs> um, so there's something wrong wrong about that, and you wouldn't think it was. We, we were hoping it wouldn't be that bad, but then when we did the Tesla IPO roadshow, we just got one investor after another asking us why our car broke down in Top Gear, particularly in Europe. Every investor we met with in Europe asked us why our car broke down. And I was like, well, this is ridiculous. So, um, and then to add salt to the wound, uh, Top Gear just kept repeating that episode. So uh, I, who knows how the, the, the lawsuit will go, but it's, it's still working its way through the British courts. And, and, and our demands are pretty simple. It's just like, stop playing that falsely, stop playing the episode where you falsely claim that, you know, or imply that our car broke down. It seems like a reasonable thing to ask for. <laughs> Do you ever feel obligated to provide philanthropic support back to South Africa? Um, well, uh, I'm not sure I'd say I, I feel obligated to provide it to South Africa specifically as a country, but um, I do do a lot of philanthropic things. Um, and, uh, and, you know, South Africa is, is sort of among the, the beneficiaries, I guess, of, of that. Um, and. Um, I've done a lot of sort of science education things. I've donated to um, um, a, a couple of educational institutions in South Africa. Um, 
but um, but o overall, in terms of my my little, fa I've got a little foundation called the Musk Foundation, and uh, um, it, I try to figure out what what's the most good I can do, um, kind of independent of one country or another, um, and um, you know, with, with a fo so with a focus on uh, science education, kind of pediatric research, and um, and kind of environmental causes. Um, all that try to make sure that the you know anything we do from an environmental standpoint that isn't related to solar city or tesla because uh, that wouldn't be right what, what is the greatest factor that has uh, enabled you to reach the point do you have in your career mm, well i think probably uh... i have a, a really high intrinsic drive um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I just get really sort of set on something, and then I just kind of am able to keep going that direction. Um, <laughs> and uh, the the reason I say it seems to be intrinsic is because when I was like five or six or something, um, and my mom grounded me. Uh, said I couldn't go play with my cousins who lived on the other side of town, I don't know, 10 miles away or 12 miles away or something. Um, and, uh, and then I was pretty mad about that. And so I, I couldn't really read. Uh, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't really read. But, and I, I only, I didn't really know the way. I mean, I kind of knew the way. Um, but I walked clear across town um, and arrived at my cousin's house several hours later. Um, freak my mom out, um, and uh, that's kind of a weird thing to do if you're five. Um, so I figured that must be something intrinsic. Uh, who are some figures that you look up to in the business world? Um, well, I think um, uh, you know, obviously somebody like Steve Jobs. I mean, everyone and their mom uh, looks up to Steve Jobs in, in that respect. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, for sure. Uh, they're friends of mine. They've done an amazing job. Um, and, uh, you know, Warren Buffett uh, on the investing side. And, um, you know, I think, I think Bill Gates has done a number of impressive things, obviously, with Microsoft and with the Gates Foundation. Um, Yeah, there's, there's a lot of great people out there, um, and, uh, and I think also historically, you know, the guys like Edison and Tesla obviously were big fans of Tesla. <laughs> um, who, who does, he, he's well known in the scientific community. The units of magnetism are units of Tesla, but he's not as well known in the in the popular mindset. So, um, so that's that's why Tesla Motors is named after him. Um, uh, you know, so I think. Uh, but I also like uh, admire people like uh, you know, Winston Churchill and um, just some of the great, interesting people. Like Oscar Wilde. I mean, there's like lots of really interesting, cool people in history. So, uh, so, so what what advice do I have for college graduates interested in getting involved in the spheres you've tapped into? Uh, well, uh, certainly, I'd invite you to uh, apply for a job at uh, Silver City or Tesla or SpaceX. Um, and uh, if not, then um, if, if, if that doesn't work for whatever reason, then uh, I guess apply to jobs at other companies in that arena or uh, try starting a company. Um, although it, I have to say that in, in, the, in the, the space business, is, is quite, it's quite hard to start a company in the space business because it's such a capital intensive business. So it may be better to do something in um, solar power. Um, or uh, if you're going to do it in cars, do it in as kind of a component supplier for cars or something like that. Um, yeah, all right. Well, this has been uh, Elon Musk answering your questions. Um, have a great day.